Welcome, guys. There's um, mostly familiar faces, which was to expect to be expected, because I sent out an email to my trusted database. I also invited some people from the Facebook um, screenwriting group. Don't know if there's anyone from that group here. Anyway, um, I can't see you anymore. So the way structure is represented is not always useful. You know, you can pretty much put a structure on anything, a brick. And often representations are not useful even if they look professional. So Aristotle's incline, a perfectly straight line going up. And I often see Aristotle's poetics translated as the beginning being at the very, at the very beginning. You know, the, you know, if you would translate that to television or film, then literally the beginning would be uh, frame one. That's not my understanding. I think Aristotle put the prologue before the beginning. The beginning was what I would call the event. And then a lot of the emphasis was on the action. So Aristotle's incline is really not about acts. It's about the beginning and then the action with increasing complications and then a denouement at the end. But yes, structure and even the three act structure if you wish you can see everywhere and then you see articles like this why the three act structure will kill your writing and the argument is it never worked and the points in this article the three act structure comes from theater it's clumsy it's general simplistic and too broad there's no emphasis on character three is not enough that gives you a weak plot and it's just downright arbitrary. And you know what? I actually agree with quite a few of those points. It is arbitrary. You know, we've settled for something quite simplistic, but we like the rule of threes. And if you know your way around it, you can use it on many, many levels. But we've settled for it. So, you know, we're stuck with it. So you better understand how it works for the screen. And the, the main thing I think is it's not the same as, as three parts. I think when we look at theater, we call it three acts, but if you compare that to screen, I think our screen stories are more rigid in terms of how we divide the acts, how we uh, decide where the turning points are, the criteria are more rigid than they are in, in theater. So it is, it's dangerous to compare them because it won't be useful. You won't be able to, 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 to use them. Um, so we've got to find something else. And this is more like the organic structure of, of what, in fact? Because you can do many, many charts and graphs about story structure. This one I would call um, the tension graph. And you can see that, could you? I'm going to go back. This is the tension graph. So Robert McKee in his book also talks about values, positive and negative values. That's something different altogether. So most graphs that we get to see are tension graphs. This one, yeah. Now, a few years ago, I had a student who done all my classes and he wanted to see the mother of all story structure models. And I said, I'm not going to give that to you because it'll be confusing and it's not helpful. You should not use stuff like that. And he said, oh, that's okay. I'll do it anyway. I've paid attention during your classes and I'll use everything that you, you've given us and I'll put together the ultimate graph. It's okay. Can you send it to me? And he sent it to me. And this is what it looked like. Is it useful? I don't know. Is it funny? Yeah, probably. By the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a microphone so I can hear you when you laugh. Um, yeah, you couldn't unmute yourself up to this point, so now you can. So if you want to. Stop me, ask a question or anything is wrong. Uh, as of this moment, I will 
hear you if you say something, if you turn your microphone off, obviously. So back to the mother of all graphs, mother of all structured charts. Can you see it? Yes, but um, might need to be a little bit enlarged. But... Yeah, but that's intentional. I don't want you to see it yet. <laughs> All right, so I just want to give you a broad perspective so you understand what we are looking at when we talk about structure. Okay, so the, the top one is really about the positive negative experience by the hero. So it would be if you were to ask the hero, uh, how are things at the beginning it would be yeah, yeah, pretty good. And then it slides down a bit and then comes back up again. And then it slides down really significantly. And then you have your lowest point there. And then in the third act, you have a significant climb. And at the end, usually in a happy ending film, you'll have a mood that is more positive than it was at the, at the beginning. So that's, that's kind of like the, the mood graph, if you, if you like. Underneath, you get the timeline. And we'll come back to the timeline because we see that often when we compare story structures. We see, we see timelines. And because film plays out in time, I think it is a useful, uh, useful approach. Now you see this outer journey, inner journey business. That's something I was, I will, I'll never forget. I was having breakfast at a cafe in Manly. Cafe is no longer there. It must have been 20 years ago. And I had been studying this outer journey and inner journey. And um, at that time, one of my teachers, Michael Haig, was claiming that there was no direct relationship between outer journey and inner journey. And um, uh, before him, Linda Seeger, who has been around in Hollywood for a long time, she also talked about plot and subplot as independent storylines. But then when I charted the story into the, to the timeline into a, an eight sequence structure, and I identified where usually the inner journey starts and where usually the outer journey starts, I noticed something that I thought was of significance because there is a correlation with the real world. As you can see here, the story starts and then the inner journey starts and only then the outer journey starts. So, and then if you, if you continue, you see that the inner journey is completed before the outer journey is completed. So the outer journey is shifted by one sequence. And um, I still believe in that, in that model. I still believe that that holds true. And to explain that principle to you, and I think that may be one of the things that you pick up today, who knows? Uh, we're going to the question, what is story all about? And I think with that shifting of the outer inner, inner journey, I think we can um, get to the bottom of why structure works on certain levels. So what is story all about? And, you know, obviously you can approach it in a million different ways. If you've watched uh, Breaking Bad, Walter White asks what chemistry is. And one of the students answers, uh, it's a study of chemicals. And he says, no. And he says, I look at it as a study of change. And I think that is what stories are really about. It's about helping us, mere mortals, cope and deal with change in our lives. If you look at how that plays out in story, there is always a period at the beginning of the story where we get into the world of the character try to understand their character, see what their strengths and weaknesses are. Weaknesses are. Um, you know, whether they're happy, usually they're not 100% happy, and then we try to understand why they're not happy. And then something happens. Some call it the inciting incident. Others call it a call to adventure. But in any case, it is change. The hero is confronted with change, uh, major change in the circumstances. This is what we deal with on a daily basis in our own lives. And it's usually what triggers our actions. Now in stories, the, the change, the event that we design is about triggering a journey of change for our hero. 
So it's about internal change. So you have external change and then internal change. Now the external change, bizarrely enough, does not start the outer journey yet, in the sense that there's something happening to the character. We are in the character's point of view. The character doesn't realize that this thing is going on and it is important. They're not paying attention. They're in denial. But we as viewers, we understand that their equilibrium has just been destroyed. We understand that, that fragile equilibrium of the first stage is no longer, and something will have to happen. In other words, something is now prodding at their flaw. Something is trying to break them down. So the inner journey has started. The, their inner flaw has been exposed. They're only not aware of it. So that's where the inner journey starts. In the timeline that we later will see, that's when the event happens. That's when the change hits our hero. Then the outer journey or the end of act one, sorry, yeah, end of act one, beginning of act two, the outer journey starts one sequence after the inner journey when the hero commits to some sort of action as a result of this event. So now they acknowledge that there's a problem, something needs to be done. And just like in the real world, in order to achieve what we want to achieve in terms of physical, tangible, material things, we first need to start ourselves. Because if we have major hangups, you know, we have major issues with ourselves, with others, we need to sort those out because they will have a major impact on what we want to achieve. So there too, our inner journey precedes our outer journey in terms of the timeline. So that shifting of these two arcs makes sense. It's relevant. It's reflective of a psychological reality. And, and I thought that was, a, that was a good insight at the time. And, and, and the, the moments that I needed to kind of pinpoint where that change uh, started, they had already been defined by various teachers. So it's, it's fairly easy to, to plot that on, on the chart. And I think that is probably a more important chart because um, the other one we'll get, we'll talk about that when we talk about Robert McKee, the one about positive and negative is slightly vaguer, slightly more malleable and um, arbitrary. This is where I wanted to talk about um, my own experience because I've been teaching this for, for quite a while. And the handsome man next to the other handsome man is Samuel Bartlett. He was one of my students in 2012. He was one of those who was challenging everything I said. And I gave him advice on his short film and he didn't take the advice. But then a week later he came back and said, I've thought about it and I'm gonna do exactly what you've recommended. At that point, he had already submitted a screenplay to the Austin Screenwriting Contest, which is one of the most respected in the world. And sadly, his script hadn't even hit the radar there. So what he did was he rewrote it with what he had learned and gave it a different title, resubmitted to the exact same film uh, screenplay contest the year after, and he made the top 10. And he was very grateful. He uh, claimed that he had learned a lot in my classes and he became my main marketing face. And he even, uh, I asked him, I said, can you, can you give me a quote? He said, yeah, I'll give you a quote. How about this one? No corral, no career. Sounds good, right? So what happened since? Well, I got a text from him last uh, Saturday and it said, so this is happening. And then there was an IMDb link underneath. And I clicked the IMDb link. It was a film in pre-production, written by Sam, featuring Morgan Freeman. Not bad. Directed by, um, what's his first name? George Gallo. Now, George Gallo is very well known in Hollywood because he wrote a few of the screenplays that have been used in screenwriting manuals as examples of buddy movies. He wrote um, Midnight Run. Yesterday, I got another text from, from Sam. He said, finished. So hang on, it wasn't pre-production. How can it be finished? 
So now he was talking about his own film that he's written and directed that is in post-production and he locked off. Bad boys, thank you, Kath. That's, that's the one. Yeah, so yeah, I should know that because I was at the Cannes Film Festival when Bad Boys was uh, premiering in 1995. All right, so this one you're familiar with now, that's the tension graph. To talk about that, and tension is probably the most important one because tension comes from conflict. Conflict is what um, drives the plot. And the plot is ultimately the core foundation of your structure. So we're going to flatten this into a timeline. And the first thing I always do with this timeline is cut it in two. Draw a line at the middle. That then becomes the midpoint reversal. Okay. Now, th that then also becomes very tempting to uh, call it a, tw a two-act structure. And uh, some of you may know that uh, I did an article about that. Um, it, I think it's useful to look at the uh, structure for film as a two-act structure. If you read Michael Arndt, who wrote Little Miss Sunshine and who uh, wrote Toy Story 3, um, he says the inciting incident causes a response by the hero that is flawed, so a flawed response. And then there's a second inciting incident that happens around the midpoint reversal. And then the second part of the film the hero is no longer showing that flawed response. They've learned, they've healed, and they, you know, they now show a different sort of behavior. So in that respect, you could say there, there are essentially two acts. So that's one approach, and you can take that approach, but it's pretty rudimentary, and probably too, too coarse to uh, say it with the author of that article in um, the Sunday, in the Raindance uh, magazine. So we're going to go back to the three-act structure and the midpoint reversal. Now, if you look at this properly, you'll see that essentially that's not a three-act structure. That's become a four-act structure. You know, that midpoint reversal cuts the second act in two. So essentially, you've got a four-act structure. And you know what? That is absolutely fine. A lot of people prefer the four-act structure. They use it in television. For the one hour episode, we talk about four acts, the meaning of those four acts and the, the, the energy is very similar to what we have in the three act structure if we place that midpoint reversal. So again, that shows that it's all down to convention. So there you go, four acts. Some say, oh, but sometimes you can have movies that have five acts. Um, uh, well, how is that? So does that render our three-act structure, uh, you know, moot uh, or even the four-act structure? Well, no. It just gives us a bigger midpoint reversal. That midpoint reversal now becomes a stage, a sequence, or an act in its own right. It would look like this. So you essentially still have your three-act structure, but by placing an extra act in the middle, you now have five acts. So you go from, from three to five straight away. So ponder over that. For Michael Haig, that's not enough. Michael Haig has a six stage structure and um, a fairly effective one, if you ask me, I think it's a very good solid structure. Uh, read his book, uh, write screenplays itself. And his, his structure looks like this. So you have, you have a short stage at the beginning another one to finish the first act. Then you have two longer stages in what we know as the second act. And then your third act has two more stages. So three acts, six stages. And you see where I'm going with this one, right? You can obviously create a seven act structure from this. Oops, hang on. Here we go. If you, if you have to. Some think it's uh, going too far. Well, I don't think we've gone far enough. Let's go back to the three-act structure and the midpoint reversal. Because the problem with that six-stage structure of Michael Haig is that you've got those big stages in the middle. And if you look at the juncture points, the end points, the, the vertical lines, as mini-climaxes, which they should be, 
then it's not going to correspond with the reality of our graph. Because if we go back to this, this graph, um, there are actually more peaks than the three you see here. And the peaks that I'm talking about, they come out if we further subdivide these acts into sequences. And then we're in the territory of Paul Golino, who wrote the sequence approach. So there you've got eight sequences spread out over the exact same three acts or four acts or whatever you want it to be. Because they're, they're, it's still the exact same story material. Right, so this is, this is a good, I think it's a good primer to just look at how the same timeline gets a, a more, more refined subdivision in order to be able to speak about the function of each of those stages. And in one of the previous masterclasses, we went into what those stages mean, what their function is. And um, in a minute, we'll also put some names on there. I've mentioned Michael Haig, I've mentioned uh, Paul Golino. We'll go over the others as well. But first, I wanted to see if there are any questions already. Let's see if I can go back to your faces, because I can't see them anymore. Oh, well, there you are. So, any questions? Because I know it's, a, it's an information dump, but you'll get access to all that uh, either through the recording or I can email you the, um, the slides if you're interested. When you went from four to five, what was that middle bit again that you called an act by itself? The it's actual reversal? reversal? Yeah, so the midpoint reversal, in, in a film like Joker, you can see that. The, the, the fifth act, so the mid-act in Joker has all to do with um, Joker going to the Wayne Mansion. It takes about, I think, 15 to 20 minutes in the film. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes. So that's, an, that is, that's as long as the other acts, pretty much. So it's, it's worth calling that an act. And when people say, oh, it's, it's like the Shakespearean five acts, well, not really, but you know the the midpoint uh, uh, is is not a it's not a point; it becomes a stage. And I'd, I'd say in the strongest films, that is often the case. Yeah. The film that I often use as reference because it's structurally uh, so very solid is The Untouchables, uh, the David Mamet written Brian De Palma film from 1986 has a whole mid-sequence um, by the Canadian border. In One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, 1974, you have a whole sequence outside the, the asylum. So you can, you can call those acts in their own right. Good question. Any other questions? And when Haig goes from five to six, is he just splitting the third act from pre-climax to post-climax? He's not really looking at the midpoint reversal as a stage. He just uh, subdivides the first and the third act. So he, he kind of acknowledges the sequences of act one and act three, but he doesn't acknowledge the sequences in act two, which I find interesting. Yeah. Why so, would you but do in that? In three, he's, I presume, splitting pre-climax, post-climax. In one, he act one, he's splitting uh, pre-inciting incident, post-inciting incident, I guess. All right, well, let's, called, let's do that. Let's now action. look at yeah. these models. Let's look at these models and see how they work for the, the best, the, the names that you know best in, um, in screenwriting. Um, maybe let, let's start with uh, Blake Snyder because that's really the simplest, the simplest approach. I think Blake Snyder is, is kind of like the four-act uh, proponent. And he recognizes the midpoint, but not as an act in its own right. He looks at that as, as a as a point more than anything else. Um, but what he will do, however, is he will obviously identify that first uh, peak in the first act as the inciting incident. Then he's got the end of act one, then he's got the midpoint, then he's got end of act two, climax of act three, and then the aftermath. So which is very similar to Michael Haig. And you'll see that Michael Haig starts quite some influence 
in the uh, at least the the Western world. Because I had a question uh, about other story structures that are not you know not Western that we wouldn't respond to very well. I don't have much uh, knowledge of those. Um, I looked at that. In, uh, I looked at Japanese structures at some point when the student looked into that. But you see that currently. Um, the structure that we that we respond to very well as Westerners is now kind of dominating the rest of the world. I don't know, however, whether there's still a Chinese um, model that is holding ground. Is, is anyone familiar with with that? Is is, is there a, a, a story structure that, that is holding the fort that we're not familiar with? No. Okay. Well, that may change over the next few years as Hollywood is losing its ground. Notes. So Michael Haig, six stages. Um, Blake Snyder, pretty much as well. Now Blake Snyder is known for his beat sheet, the BSBS, the Blake Snyder beat sheet, and yeah, double double BS to a degree. Now that's a mix of moments and stages, and that's where a lot of screenwriters, aspiring screenwriters, get confused. And that's not just the case for Blake Snyder; it's also the case for the hero's journey. They look at these numbers, you know. Number one, ordinary world. Number one, uh, number two, call to adventure. Number three, uh, refusal of the call, and so forth. And then they don't really distinguish between moments and stages, because the, the call to adventure can can be a stage, but ultimately it is a moment of realization. It's a moment when the character realizes that something is afoot. Something there's a big problem, and we need to respond to that. That is, that is one moment. The same happens around the midpoint reversal. It's a moment. Um, the transition from act two, sorry, beginning act one into act two, you first need a realization. And then you can have a stage that becomes a threshold, but you need a moment there. So in terms of structures, it's important to distinguish between stages and, and, and moments. Uh, a good tip to not lose the wood for the trees is stages are usually action driven moments are usually events driven what does that mean something happens to the character that's an event that's a moment of realization then the characters respond over a period of time that response is rarely an, an instant response an action will usually play out over time. And that's often, that's the hardest job for the screenwriter is coming up with the action to sustain the drama, to sustain the duration of your story. So Haig, um, check. Blake Snyder, check. How about Robert McKee? The biggest of them all. Over 50,000 students. The whole of Hollywood has read his book. He alone is a reason why we should study structure because the influential people we speak with have read his book and they may use his language, his um, vocabulary as reference. So you better know about that. So it is useful to read Robert McKee's book, even if ironically it's titled story and is exactly what it, uh, to, to, to my taste, um, you know, leaves a lot to answer. It, it is not strong in story. It's very, very basic. Um, he pretty much states the inciting incident and then you've got complications and then you've got your, your crisis at the end of act two and then you've, you've got your climax in act three. And then you can have subplots and those subplots can be pretty much anywhere. That's, that's it. I mean, if you look at his, the, the chapter on structure in his book stories is quite traditional he doesn't really contribute a lot to that the book is brilliant in other areas we've covered mckee in our logline class as well we've talked about how he tries to capture the essence of a film in what he calls the controlling idea and we try to dismantle what that means but you know when you start asking questions uh, very quickly the thing falls apart all right, John Truby has 22 steps and he rails against the three-act structure. And then when you lay out 22 steps over the timeline, you see that they beautifully coincide with 
everything that the three act structure is known for. So it's more a marketing approach than anything else, you know, because if you, if you want to sell, you want to sell books, you better bring something new to the table. So rather than using the big chunks that we call acts and the smaller chunks that we call sequences, he's going to divvy it up even further. And now he's got 22. That's more than everyone else. Well, actually, there's one person who's got more than everyone else because um, he's broken down the hero's journey, which Chris Fogler has 12 stages. Joseph Campbell had 17 stages. And then I forgot his name. He works out of Britain. He had initially had the 55 stages of the hero's journey. Bruce, you, were you going to help me? Oh, I was going to say John York, but I don't think he did. It's yeah. not, no, I think John York's more about five act structure. I think he, he does the, yeah, the mid, the mid sequence, but um, yeah, his name escapes me now, but he, th this dude went all the way up from 550 to 2000, the 2000 stages of the hero's journey. Well, good luck with that. I'm also, I'm not going to cover that. Obviously I'm also not going to cover, cover Dramatica because I humbly admit I've never studied it. It is very complex. People who use it rave about it. And there's one thing I do recommend. There's a brilliant article on the Dramatica website that, may, that does an analysis of all these different um, story approaches. And it's written by Chris Huntley. And I think I've got a quote here. And I think it's a relevant quote because you, you may ask yourself, well, why don't we stick to simplicity? You know, keep it simple. Well, he has this argument for keeping some level of complexity. And I need to, uh, lost my mouse. Lost my cursor now. Um, yeah, I do want to show that. I'm going to have to, oh, <laughs> make sure I don't click the end meeting. All right, I'm going to have to start, try something else here. The annoying bug when your cursor disappears. All right, well, I'm going to ignore it for now. All right, I will. We'll move to the next one in line. We've had Truby with the 22. The hero's journey. It's my favorite one. Why? Because it is founded in the real deal. It's founded in psychology and mythology. It has a, a good foundation for all the structural elements. And it makes sense. It's also universal. It is more universal, I think, than a lot of people claim. Um, I, I was amused when Chris Fogler had traveled the world to promote the book and he returned to Hollywood and he wrote a revision to his book. And he said, I found in my travels that pretty much every country in the world uses some sort of form of the hero's journey model, except for two countries, Germany and Australia. And for Germany, he linked it to the fear of a heroic character that would become too dominant as a fallout of the Second World War. And for Australia, he actually had no explanation. He said something about the Australian soul that was different from the rest of the world. And um, I, I refuse to believe that. And, and I did some research, and it turned out that Chris Vogler had been wine and dined by the Australian Film Commission, and he had been exposed to a lot of Australian films, Australian films that were funded by the Australian Film Commission. And yes, they are very, very different from anything anyone watches at the box office and pays money to see. So that had distorted Vogler's vision. And he updated his book with, with that note. And I go like, no, dude, you haven't done your homework properly. Because, you know, a box office, is very similar to other Western world, uh, Western countries. So there you go, hero's journey. Now I'm not going to go into detail because that is obviously a whole class in its own right. I want to finish up with my favorite one. It's Paul Golino. Um, he didn't invent the wheel himself. He got it from um, 
Frank Daniel, Hungarian, worked in the 1980s and has uh, quite, quite a few disciples still, uh, disciples still alive and, and Golino is probably the most important one. So his book, The Screenwriting, uh, The Sequence Approach, is something I highly recommend. It's only about 20 pages of theory and then he analyzes about 20 films or 10 films from different eras um, in terms of dramatic tension, which is the heart of drama, it's dramatic tension, and dramatic irony, which is the exception to the, the rule of um, dramatic tension. So I highly recommend that. Golina is also known for a sequence approach, obviously, where he subdivides the story into short segments and he explains why sequences are effective and why they are of the length that um, we, we observe, which is 10 to 15 minutes each and also why it is on average eight, eight sequences for a feature length uh, film. So check out that book. It's brilliant and it will teach you uh, a lot more than just structure. It, it talks about tension, dramatic tension and conflict in quite a bit of detail. I highly, highly recommend that. Um, yeah. See if there's any way of getting my cursor back here. Oh, there we go. It's back. I accidentally clicked a bin. Don't know what that has to do with it. Before I go to further questions, I want to quickly talk about the masterclasses that we do here every week. Ah, the quote. Yeah, here's the quote from Chris Huntley. And the question was, why should we go into so much detail? Shouldn't we just stick with our three-act structure and not bother about any further detail? He says, plot structure problems generally come in two areas. The plot pieces don't fit together properly or there are plot holes, pieces missing from the plot. When it comes to identifying and fixing plot problems, less usually is not better. In fact, persistent plot problems are often more closely tied to plot elements an author has not considered than plot elements the author has reworked. Having more tools with which to evaluate and construct a story is more valuable in those instances. And I think it was a fair point. Chris Huntley. So uh, Google his name, you'll find uh, the article. By the way, this is the famous Hero's Journey overview. I should say, now I have access to the uh, slides, I should say a few words about fractal structure. Now, if you know about fractals, if you zoom in on a fractal, you see the same structure reoccur on a deeper level, uh, only smaller, identical but smaller. Dramatic structure works in the exact same way. If you look at the structure of a feature film, you you'll find a similar structure on a smaller level for the act, the sequence, even the scene, even the line of dialogue or you know, the, the, the block of dialogue. If you go higher up, you'll find the same structure within um, a limited series or a season of episodes or even an entire series. So that, that structure seems to be ingrained in our DNA and keeps, seems to be coming back on every level. Now, television structure, I mentioned the four acts. That is for the hour. Usually a half hour has three acts and a sitcom has two acts. And it's usually easy to identify them in the screenplay because they're written in the script. For um, commercial television, the networks with commercials, it's very easy because the acts are uh, uh, bookended with commercials. And that's what, what we will find in um, a lot of our streamers drama as well. It seems as if we're now so accustomed to these dramatic units that even without commercials, we still see the same sort of structure in television. I wanted to tell you what we're going to do as of the 1st of September here in our master classes on Fridays and Saturdays. So we have um, the following topics lined up for you. I'm going to talk about character introductions, not just how you write them in the script, but also how you devise them, how you design them, how you uh, set them up. We'll talk about how to read scripts, how assessors read scripts, how producers read scripts, um, what to do when you write your first draft, how to use flashbacks, what is a character, character arc, how you improve it. We'll talk a bit about 
antagonists and the bonus session in October, end of October, will be about pitching skills. And um, if you're interested in joining us, as some of you have already done, just go to the website screenwriting.courses and click on the camera um, or go to mc.screenwriting.courses. So if you go to the web, mc. as in masterclass, mc.screenwriting.courses, there you'll find all options. Um, available and it's I think it's pretty affordable knowing that many one-hour seminars or webinars you often pay fifty to hundred dollars here you get seven for forty nine dollars US that's two months so a whole two months all right any questions left now's the moment Alex do you have a question okay. yeah I just curious so I'm, trying, I'm reading between the lines here so what you're saying is well that's what I'm thinking is if you want to have any glimmer of hope in, in, a, in a Hollywood context, you really need to look at that three act structure. Like, like do, do producers over there kind of look for that? You know what I mean? When they're looking at a script, they're saying, oh, well, you know, I can see the three act structure here or whatever, or do they, you know, is it that kind of explicit or is it sort of? Yeah, that's a good question. I think some of them, <laughs> there's three categories. They're the ones that, and, 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 and I think people underestimate how many there are that really understand story structure. There are a lot of them that really understand story structure very well and will have a high level uh, discussion about it with you. And if you can't do that, well, then that's it. That's the end of it, right? And then you have those who have no interest. They just want to read a script and they want to, they want to be engaged by it. And then you have the most dangerous Part. The dangerous group is, is those who know it all, but don't understand it. They will start arguing with you, but you know that they've got it completely wrong. They don't understand one thing, but they claim they know it all because they have been to, they went to see Mar to, uh, Robert McKee and now they, they hold the truth. And then you have to just be humble and listen and, and, and yeah, they're right. They're right. And you're going to do, you're going to write that second act uh, three, three pages longer as it should be. And you do you your own thing. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a matter of, um, it, it really makes an impact on readability, but it's also a matter of having that vocabulary. Kath. Just to, to go back to, um, talking about midpoints for just one second. Um, because I have this conversation with people a lot. Okay. I'm fascinated to term it a midpoint sequence is very freeing because often everyone's always looking for this one moment. So would you define that moment being, for instance, you know, I know you've heard, I've heard you talk about the lives of others, which is, that, that, so that's more of a moment and a sequence would be more of a joker. So that kind of then goes into that, um, I guess that um, structure point of people thinking that that's an act of its own when they're kind of separating it that way. Yeah. Um, check out my, my midpoint reversal uh, classes. Um, I, in my understanding, the midpoint reversal consists of two moments, a high and a low, mm -hmm. and they can follow each other very quickly and they can have a whole sequence in between. The example of the, the long sequence is Joker. Mm -hmm. The example of very quick succession is Groundhog Day. It's the kiss and the slap mm -hmm. in the same scene. Mm -hmm. So he gets a kiss. That's it. He's achieved it. He's at the highest point. Immediately thereafter, she sees through him, him, and that's it. End of the midpoint. So there, it, yeah, it can be one scene. Okay, great. I think that those are probably good examples. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, now we're on it. I'd like to mention the uh, Once Live the Cuckoo's Nest. At the beginning of the sequence, he's at his highest. He feels freedom. He's going out fishing. At the end of that sequence, he learns that he is now uh, held in the asylum indefinitely and he's got nothing to say. So that massive, massive reversal. Yeah. So that's that uh, as close to and as far away kind of. Correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah, absolutely. Good. All right, guys, we're, uh, we're seven minutes over, but that's okay. I hope that this brought some insights and some levels. Um, here, I'm gonna ask you a favor. Send me an email with one line. Just tell me the one thing you picked up from today's session. I'm, I'm curious what that might be. I hope that it was w one thing new that you had not heard before 
or that you were happy to to hear uh, from me because you haven't found it anywhere else. Thank you. And hope to see you again in two weeks' time for our next round. Good Have a great you. weekend. See you guys. Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks all Carol. Right. Good to see you. Okay. Bye. Everyone. Ciao.